Welcome back to the Director's Garage. I am your host and resident idiot, Michael, and today we got ourselves an old-fashioned shootout. I haven't done that in a while. Well, today it's worth it because I have two exceptional planar magnetic driver IEMs, identical prices and affordable. What? I know. It's like, is this the director's garage? But it's true. Yes, yes. Either of these two headphones can be had for just $200 each. Now, I know what you're thinking. Dude, why even waste your time? These can't be that good. Oh, but my friends, if you haven't heard them, you're in for a major shock. Both of these headphones, I'm talking about the 7 Hertz Timeless and the Muse Hi-Fi Power, I priced each of them at over $1,000 when I demoed them blind. Now, maybe you're thinking my hearing is shit, and it might be, but okay. I'd remind you that I have heard IEMs that range from $80 all the way up to $3,500. I've owned the Mest, the Nana, and just about everything from 64 Audio and most of Noble's offerings. And of course, the Empire Ears Odin. Now, I'm telling you right now, both of these headphones at least stand with the Nana and the Mest. I will make you a few promises. If you buy the winner of this shootout, you will not be FOMOing to a higher level. These are not your budget IEMs. These are kilobuck killing IEMs. They perform on a level that puts $500 and $1,000 headphones to shame. And they do require a lot of power to get it done. But I can also promise you off the top, only one of these IEMs will come out on top. And true to Director's Garage fashion, if the challenger, in this case the power, wins the shootout, I will not only purchase the power, but I will give away the timeless in the upcoming giveaway. I like having some high stakes to these things. Now I gotta give a quick shout out to Audio46 for providing me with the Challenger, the Muse Hi-Fi Power. If you've been living under a rock, Audio46 is your personal audio superstore. They have everything you need from Chord's amazing Mojo 2 to the interesting Shozy Form 1.4, which has a 9.2 millimeter beryllium dynamic driver and an IEM, it's so cool. Even the latest Estelle and Kern players if you have a desire, they'll hook you up. They ship fast and free. And if you use the coupon code Director's Garage, all one word, you can knock an extra 5% off most of the items they stock. It's a total win win, and they are the very best in the business. Now we're gonna kick this shootout off with ergonomics as usual. No surprise there. Now, I'm told that the power may have a revision on the body with a slightly smaller housing, but I can only review what I have in front of me, so I'll tell you, these are a little bit chunky, kind of like me. Hey! <laughs> but <laughs> I found that they do have a traditional fit and they're perfectly comfortable, about average on the feels. But the Timeless, they have a much different approach to design. Seven Hertz pretty much threw out the script with these, and it kind of works, sort of. These things are kind of like putting quarters in your ear on some level. But I can tell you that the standard tips that I normally use, which is the 10 Mac Turbos, I link in the description, I, I can't use them on this IEM. I changed to the foam Dakoni bullets to solve the problem. The bullets, I probably give back a little bit of base with using them, but the sacrifice for all day wearability is totally worth it. Now the Timeless are connected with an MMCX connector, whereas the Power comes with a standard two pin. And I gotta give an edge to the Power here because it's just easier to find these two pin cables. Now the Power also ships with this kind of crappy but <laughs> serviceable flipper case that you don't mind what happens to it. You can throw it in a bag, you don't care if you destroy it. 7 Hertz has been doing this thing where they ship everything with this massive aluminum block case. This is the one for the Eternal, but you throw this in a bag with your phone or something and it's just gonna scratch it up or damage it. It's a really bad idea. So I gotta give a total win here in Ergos. 
the power with an early lead in the shootout. Okay, let's start talking about the sound properties because that's kind of what we're here for, right? And I, I just want to say off the bat that I amped both of these IEMs using the Woo Audio WA11 Topaz, which is really an ideal pairing for demanding IEMs like these. Generally, the more power you give a planar magnetic IEM, the better they're going to sound. Now, I ran both of them off of the Pentacon output connector of the WA11, and I gave the power a little bit of an advantage here. I used a fancier cable. Not that it really matters. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I just don't have anything fancy with an MMCX connector, so it's a stock cable for the 7 hertz timeless. Let's get things started with detail, and there's a clear winner in the detail category, and it's the 7 Hertz Timeless. Everything just has greater focus. Intricate passages play out with separation and distinction. A perfect example would be Dexter Gordon's A Night in Tunisia. Pierre Michelot is using brushes, and he's rubbing them around on the top of the snare at the beginning of the song. And on the 7 Hertz Timeless, it's immediately clear what he's doing. On the power, it kind of sounds like tape hiss. It just doesn't have that kind of resolution. So the Timeless racks up an early win here, and we're just getting started. Next up is Soundstage, and while neither of these IEMs is going to deliver a world-class Soundstage, let's be honest, these are IEMs, people. You're not going to get Soundstage Nirvana out of an IEM, but, but the power is decidedly wider to my ears, though the detail of the Timeless, there seems to be a little more space in between the instruments, but it's definitely a closer placement, so i got to give an edge to the power here in the Soundstage. But when we talk imaging, I'm going to give this one to the Timeless. They're just so damn fast. It, the image is just sharper in general. Everything is locked in place now on both of these IEMs. It's just there's a greater degree of resolution on the Timeless. The sound comes from a more specific place in the stage. <laughs> Next we get to dynamics, and I'm almost tempted to give this one to the power because they do get that quiet to loud thing pretty well, but the speed and the efficiency of the timeless bring exceptional surprises. Look, I hear most of my audition tracks over and over and over. But it's that familiarity with the songs that allows me to tell if a particular IEM is doing a better job than the other. And the Timeless provides me with greater surprises throughout these tracks. Little pops of sound that are sometimes overlooked, on the Timeless they step forward and they're a delight to experience. And lastly, before we move on, I want to talk about instrumentation for a second. Some people call this realism. How real do the instruments sound on each IEM? And forgive the pun, but time and time again, the timeless deliver more realism in the instruments. I describe the instruments as sounding three-dimensional on the timeless. They have more depth and they have more life to them. The power just sounds a little bit flatter when you compare them side by side. So now it's time to head into sound structure. And you know what we're talking about. We're talking bass and mids and treble in that order. 110 episodes, that still doesn't get old. Okay, we're going to start with the bass. And, and the power has a thick bass, even has more slam but it's kind of a messier slam than the Timeless. It blooms out a bit, depending on the song you're playing. The 7 Hertz bass digs deep, deep, deep into the sub, and it's surprisingly tight for what it is. There is very little bloat and great supply. That 13 millimeter planer, it just packs a wallop, and it has control, so it's an easy bass win on the Timeless. Now in the mids, both are recessed with no real honk to speak of. Each delivers a quality mid, but I'm going to give the edge to the timeless because there's just a slight amount of forwardness that lets vocals really pop, whereas the power kind of smooths everything over. Vocals are better integrated with the Muse Hi-Fi, but I prefer the way the timeless is getting on with it. And that leaves, of course, treble. 
And on the timeless, things can go slightly brighter to my ears. There's a crispness to the timeless that sets it apart. But on the wrong track, they can go just a smidge into harshness. The power stays perfectly sorted on the top end, enough to eke out a slight win here. Though in general, for the most part, the treble is more exciting on the timeless. Like time for the music section, and I haven't done this for a while, so I'm gonna get a, get a, get a big music section going today. I'm gonna start it out with Alicia Keys and her 2007 romp, As I Am. It's compressed pop with piano, synth, and electronic percussion, and it's just a ton of fun. On the big single, No One, the soundstage comes to the fore with echoes of the lead vocal flying all over the soundstage. On a pair of IEMs, I wouldn't expect much, but the power Power brings it with the effects, giving terrific spatial treats that I find incredibly entertaining. This album was at the height of the loudness wars and it shows. I had a great time auditioning tracks and I want to call your attention to a deep track, Another Way to Die, which was a collab with Jack White. And man, oh man, it is just fun, awesome greatness. The whole album would be worth it for this track alone. Sensational dynamics. The song shoots out of the gate like a cannon and then implodes on itself for the verse. I love songs that expand and contract like this. This was actually the Bond theme for the movie Quantum of Solace, and it's completely Bond-worthy. First ever duet to perform the 007 theme. The Timeless is a bit cleaner, but that soundstage of the power, mm, oh, the extra bloat on the electronica just works so well. Great synergy. I give the power the edge. Now for today's feature, I'm heading back to 1970 and the Grammy winning Simon and Garfunkel album, Bridge Over Troubled Water. One of the best albums in music history. It's a classic. Soaring themes of loneliness and isolation, struggle and introspection, and frankly, sex. But let's do a shallow dive into one of rock's greatest duos first. Now, Paul and Art were elementary school friends from Queens. You could say they owe their careers to the Everly Brothers, their idols from one perspective, but it's Paul's growth as a songwriter that managed to keep the duo relevant over the years, whereas the Everlys were more of their time. They started their careers performing as the duo Tom and Jerry, mostly covering Everly Brothers songs. Their first single, Hey School Girl, became a hit on the label Big Records because their promoter, Sid Prozen, bribed disc jockey Alan Freed with $200 to play the song on his radio show. The practice led to one of the great early scandals of rock and roll, the Payola scandal. Now, Freed is credited with giving rock and roll its name. He did a lot toward integrating black and white music on his show, but Payola effectively ended his career. Now, in the 1960s, Paul, who's the songwriter and the musical force behind Simon and Garfunkel, well, he fell in love with folk music, and he revamped the duo's sound. They scored a contract with Columbia Records as Simon and Garfunkel and recorded a debut album in 1964 that went nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., sold only about 3,000 copies. Imagine that. Paul moved to England, Art went back to college, and the guys broke up for the first time. Then, something screwy happens. It's one of Rock's great legends. A year later, in 1966, a late-night DJ in Boston starts playing The Sounds of Silence. It's a track off Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., only this version is stripped down. It's not the song that you or I know. Their producer at Columbia, Tom Wilson, He's the guy who later produces Dylan's move from acoustic to electric. Well, he catches wind of this and he remixes the song behind the guy's backs. He adds electric guitars, bass, and drums and releases it. And the new single starts climbing the Hot 100, only he didn't bother to tell the boys. And the word is, Paul is horrified by this new mix. 
Anyway, the new mix of The Sounds of Silence sells over a million copies, and the label orders the guys back into the studio and rushes out a new album under the same name. Basically, it's a cash grab to make up for the disastrous failure of the first album. It's comprised mostly of songs that Paul wrote while he's away in England, but it did produce three solid hits, and Simon and Garfunkel go on tour. The next album, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Time, is more considered, and Simon takes full control of the studio for the first time with a much bigger budget. The album is a big hit, but after its release, Paul suffers from writer's block, and it lasts nearly a full year. They perform at the Monterey Pop Festival and finally rebound in 1968 with Mrs. Robinson for the Mike Nichols movie, The Graduate. Then they get into a confrontation with their record label, and they release the album Bookends. But by 1969, and I'm compressing time here a little bit, Art is breaking into Hollywood and he's shooting a movie in Mexico while Paul is writing songs back in New York. And by the time they reunite, the tensions between the two are really high. They skip the Woodstock Festival to work in the studio on the new record, and Paul pulls out all the stops. He's using full orchestration, Latin rhythms, horn sections, and he's layering their vocals unlike anything they've ever done in the past. And the results showed. The song, Bridge Over Troubled Water, is their big breakout. With its gospel influence, it's recorded by everyone from Elvis Presley to Johnny Cash. And those versions capture the grandeur, but not the haunting quality of that original recording. And nearly every song on this album is a masterwork. From inventive percussion to soaring horn sections, there are tributes to the Beach Boys and there's an homage to the Everly Brothers by the end of it. But at the same time, Paul is really frustrated by Art's interests outside of music and there's just a personal acidity between the two of them. Paul was done. He just wanted out. But what remains is a spectacular album to end their official partnership. Back on topic, this album is really best on the 7 Hertz Timeless. Uh, all that detail and dynamic superiority just makes it a perfect match. To be fair, this album pretty much sounds great on anything. Okay, we are deep deep into the show, so it's time to start bringing it all home, don't you think? Go. All right. Both of these $200 planar magnetic IEMs do a remarkable job of delivering exceptional sound that, blind listening, I pegged at five times the cost of the headphone. I'd say if you're very sensitive to treble and you really need it knocked down, or if you value soundstage above anything else, you might prefer the Muse Hi-Fi Power. But those are really the only two cases I can think of where I would recommend the power over the 7 Hertz Timeless. 7 Hertz blew up the IEM world when the Timeless was released just six months ago, and it continues to be the choice for a practical endgame IEM as long as you have something with decent power to drive them. But at this price, you can easily add a Woo WA-11 or an iFi IDSD signature without breaking the bank and still have money left over for a decent player. The 7 Hertz Timeless features extraordinary world-class bass, unbelievable clarity, speed, dynamics, imaging, all the great things we value in a product, plus they're just plain musical and a joy to listen to, all for just $200. It's not only the winner of this shootout, but it's a headphone you need to jump way up the ladder to even get into a reasonably fair comparison. It obliterates nearly any IEM under the $1,000 price point. Unless you're struggling for power, I can't in good conscience tell you to buy anything else anywhere near this price. They're just that good. 
Next up, we're heading into guilty pleasure territory. It's a headphone that's been sitting in a box here for months and one that I've always wanted to hear. So it'll be an unboxing and a shootout all in one. So make sure you are subscribed to the director's garage so you don't miss it. I want to thank you all for spending a few minutes of your day here today. Give the episode a thumbs up if you appreciated this shootout. Or you can do the other thing if you'd just rather see me shot. I can't say I blame you either way, but I will see you before you know it.